I feel like what our worship team just did, that was my sermon, okay? <laughs> I'll see you guys. That was amazing. Oh my goodness. And that last song, woo, giving author given authority. That reminds me of a couple years ago when um, I was one of, at one of the retreats. I don't remember where it was. I, with, I was with Corey and somebody prophesied over me and the gentleman said that I, I am given authority to sing to the nations of the Lord. And he looks at me and he goes, do you sing? Only in the shower. I sound amazing in the shower. But if you were to hear me sing worship, it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe a cow is passing or something. That's what I sound like. But I'm like, I don't sing. And I was kind of like, this guy's wacko. Like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I didn't accept his prophecy over my life because clearly I can't sing. And then just now... I got this huge revelation from Jesus singing the song. I have been giving authority, but my song sounds different. My, I, I don't have, I have a different kind of melody, if that makes sense. Like, I don't necessarily carry a tune. Lord knows I can't, but I do have a voice, and I know that I have been given authority, and this gives me courage, and it gives me um, uh, an immense kind of strength to share the truth of the gospel. And I hope that you have some ears to hear what I have to share with you today, because this has been a heavy thing for me to write. Um, I've known for a long time I was going to uh, speak uh, in the sermon series, I've known for a couple of months, and guess when your girl wrote the sermon? Thursday night, okay? So I, I've been really uh, struggling with exactly what I wanted to share because I know that pretty much everything has been covered so far in this series. We've covered a lot of good things, and especially last week, it was so good for me to hear about shame uh, because that's actually what I wanted to focus on, but then when I heard Pastor Shannon, he put it so beautifully, I didn't even need to say anything about it. So I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you have for you people today? And, the, and so I do believe that I have a special message for you today, and I hope that you will come out feeling more free and feeling more loved than you did when you came in here. But let's get started. Let me ask you this. Who is excited about this Christmas season? Okay, give me like a thumbs up for, yes, oh my goodness, 2020, man, we're ready for it to go, but I don't want to rush through this season. And not just for, you know, the material things that we get out of Christmas season, but there's something absolutely special about the Christmas season, because we've been given the best gift of all, we've been given the gift of Jesus. And I know that I have a lot to celebrate this season, but I also know that statistically, there is somebody in this room right now who has very little to celebrate this Christmas season. So, so, somebody has taken something away from you. You might have lost your job. You don't know how you're going to cover the bills to pay for your kids' Christmas. There is, there is a lot that you feel like has been taken away from you. This COVID alone has taken so much. But let me tell you this, that God has not forgotten you. He has never stopped thinking about you. He's always been walking alongside you. He's an empathetic God. He empathizes with you because he became man. He became a human being 2,000 years ago. And so now he can fully empathize with you because he has experienced life and he has experienced disappointments just like we do today. So our God is a relational God, and that's something that's worthy of celebration. But speaking of Christmas, I do love the, I do love the best, best gift of all Jesus, but I also want to tell you that I love other gifts. Like, I love material gifts. I've come to realize that, that it's one of my top love languages. I love buying gifts for people and watching them unwrap the gifts and enjoy it because that's how I show my love. But I also love receiving gifts just as much. And um, I'm, yes, I'm finally speaking the truth. So, Corey, Christmas, um, uh, Christmas morning, I better open up some good ones. I do love receiving gifts, but I know not, not everyone in this room loves receiving gifts, right? Kind of give me like a, like blink a lot at me, okay? If uh, receiving gifts makes you feel uncomfortable a little bit, like you owe something to somebody, especially if those gifts are extravagant. When you open them, you feel awkward because now you feel like you have to give them just as nice of a gift or you feel like you owe them something, right? Because Gifts like that might come with strings attached, or you feel in your heart that they do, even though it might not be a reality. Uh, so I know that not everybody in here loves receiving gifts or feels comfortable. I love receiving gifts. I feel comfortable receiving them. So if you guys want to give me gifts anytime, I'm down. <laughs> 
but I know that something all of us have in common in this room, and it's this. We struggle receiving gifts from Jesus. Even I do, okay? I love getting gifts, but even, even I struggle with fully re- accepting and receiving the gifts that Jesus has given us. I mean, let me list some of them for you. Like, he's given us the gift of forgiveness, unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. He's given us the gift of righteousness. He's calling us blameless. He's given us the gift of Jesus. All of these gifts are priceless. Like, you can't attach a price on, on a gift like this. And then there is no way that, it, that gifts like what God has given us come without any strings attached. They just are way, they're too big to come without any strings attached. And this is where religion likes to slither in, right? And this is where you start listening to some lies and you're, okay, right, there are some strings. I got I to gotta behave a certain way and I got to treat people a certain way. I got to do this. I got to do that. And that's a religious mindset. And what I've appreciated about this particular sermon series is that I have been exposed through the Spirit, through the sermon series, about a couple of areas of my life where I am struggling with accepting all of God's giftings. And I, I hear I thought that I had it all figured out, and I truly don't. It, I still have areas in my life where I am really struggling. I'm like, God, did you, do you really give me this? Do you really call me blameless? Especially last week after the sermon about shame, and how heavy it is, and, and I realize there are certain areas of my life where I carry shame when it comes to parenting. I'm so hard on myself, and I, but God is calling me a good daughter, even though I don't feel like I'm a good parent to my kids at times. Do you, do you really call me blameless, and am I really your friend, even though I'm, you know, I feel like I'm disappointing you in this moment? When I'm allowing my feelings, right, overtake, when I'm trying to, when I'm parenting my kids, like that's, that's an area that I, you know, I'm being transparent that I uh, really struggle with accepting God's giftings. But I mean, that's the beauty of our, of our God. He's a really good God and he's a relational God and he empathizes with me with everything that I go through. He's never left me alone. And under the new covenant, we've been given an amazing gift, a gift of a new identity, we are blameless and righteous and holy in God's eyes. And it has nothing to do with like how we behave. It has everything to do with who Jesus is. He's just so good like that. And we're so blessed to have him. It kind of leads me to the scripture that I wanted to uh, share with you guys. And like I said, I've known for a couple of months that I was going to preach. And I, I was praying every day, okay, God, give me, give me a good verse uh, to, that you want me to share with the people. What, what kind of life do you want me to speak over people? And then nothing was coming. And I was like, It was, you know, Tuesday, then Wednesday, and I was like, do I go to, like, freesermons.com and download something and share it? I don't know. (laughs) I actually don't know if that's real, but I didn't know what what to, you know, what to share with you guys. And then, all of a sudden, as I'm reading through just random scriptures, just searching, and then this scripture jumps out at me, and I'm like, I can't believe I never saw this before. So, you might already have not like extensive knowledge of what I'm about to share, but it was new to me, so I'll share it with you. And the scripture that I'm going to take you to is uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'll, I'll be reading it to you from the, uh, me, uh, from the Passion Version because I really like the Passion Translation of the New Testament. I highly advise you guys to just like on your Bible app thing, switch to Passion with me because it just really does a good job of exposing the heart of the Father. So I'm going to take you again to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And I think they'll be behind me. And, yep, on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read them for you. So this is Paul speaking. Now, if anyone, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, everybody say enfolded. It's a good word, people. He has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself. Everybody say reconciled. It's a good word. And given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted us to the ministry of opening the door. Everybody say door. It's another good word, people, of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. 
For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. My word, this is a powerful piece of scripture right here. I, when I read it, and I've read through the scripture before, and, and Pastor Shannon, I believe, touched on it too, talking about being ambassadors, but I just kind of skimmed through. So the focus was, I am a new creation, and then... Uh, uh, we might know righteousness through God. I've always, you know, I've always focused on the start and the, and the end of these scriptures. I've never really focused on the centerpiece. And this is where I want to take you guys today. So, uh, but before I do, there is one word that I had you guys say, which is enfolded. Okay. And this is why I love the Passion Translation once again. So enfolded means surround, envelop, or hold someone lovingly in their arms. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ... You are lovingly held in Christ. Like he is holding you. This is a message for you. You are not too dirty. You are not too messed up. You are not too unholy. God's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to touch you and touch your life. If you don't hear anything else from me today, just hear that, that you are enfolded into Christ. He is lovingly holding on to you. He doesn't have any regrets about you. You are loved. I love that. And so it also, the scripture tells us here that we have been reconciled to God because of Jesus and God being the ultimate gift giver, he doesn't stop there. So he doesn't only reconcile us, but then he gives us another beautiful gift. And it is the gift of reconciliation. It is the ministry of reconciliation. Others to Christ. I don't want you to think of this as a job or a task or a to-do list. You, it's not your job to save people. Okay, it's just not, you're, you haven't been assigned that job, but you have been assigned to be an ambassador and you have been giving the ministry of reconciliation. This is a true gift because now you get to be a part of someone else's experience of getting to know who God is and being brought back to friendly relations because that's what reconciliation is. To reconcile means to bring back or to restore friendly relations and that's what ambassadors do. And so my question to you is, so uh, we know in, you know, this is a spiritual, uh, uh, you know, uh, scriptures where we, we feel an overwhelming sense of peace. We, we love it that we are new creations. We are ambassadors. But how does the spiritual translate into practical? So this is where I often struggle myself. And that's why I want, that's where I'm taking you today is the practical application of what it's like to be an actual effective ambassador. What, how do you, how do you uh, uh, bring about the ministry of reconciliation? And so I've got like four pieces of identity of what an ambassador is that I wanted to share with you. And the first one is this. As an ambassador, I help restore people. And this is a part of this ministry of reconciliation. As an ambassador, I help restore people. And I didn't write it down as, as an ambassador, you help restore people or we help restore people. I chose the specific wording, I, because you need to take ownership of this. And I need to take ownership of this. What is it like to restore people? What, is, what, is that, what does that even look like? How do, you, how do you help restore people? You have a mouth, you speak life over them. You have time, you spend time with them. It is not your job to judge people based on their actions. You, you are not in control of other people's lifestyles. Just like how they're not in control of yours. You both, you and that individual, you guys make your separate choices and you have to live with them. But as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, a part of this ministry of reconciliation, you have got to help restore people. We know plenty of people who need to be restored. Back to, their, back to their original identity as a child of God. And this is the beauty, again, of the gospel. And if we want to be effective ambassadors, we have got to restore people. We have to encourage people around us, constantly speak life over them. And we have to remember that when we are tempted to judge people for their actions and condemn them, we have to remember that God's justice looks a little different. God's justice has always been restorative. He is here to restore people. Okay, and it's, it's, it's very, very challenging because we, I know that we all have people that we don't want to help restore. It's just a part of, it's the truth, but it's also the gospel right here because it's not I who live, right, but Christ who lives in me. And we can allow the spirit guide us in this process. The second thing is an ambassador, I am a safe person. 
This is a part of that, again, ministry of reconciliation. I am a safe person. We know so many people in this world who don't have someone who's always in their corner and who's loved them unconditionally. We know those people. And then how can we expect the people to ever come to a full understanding of God's unconditional love if they've never truly experienced it from anyone else? They don't have a safe person they can go to. How can we expect people to do that? We can't. You know, an ambassador lives in an embassy. An embassy is a piece of the territory, right, of the country that they represent where they have full authority. So if you ever travel overseas and you run into trouble of some sort, the safest place for you to go to is an American embassy. That's a safe place for you. Are you a safe place for other people? Do they feel safe in your presence? Do they know you have their back, no matter their actions and no matter their lifestyle? Are you a safe person for people? That's, again, a heavy, another heavy aspect of the, of the identity of an ambassador, right? We're not quitters. We're doers. We help people feel safe. And, again, we don't save people, right? We don't S-A-V-E people. We make people feel safe in our presence. So that way we can invite the Spirit and the Spirit of God will do His own thing. But it is our job to provide that safety net for people. We need to, we need to have people's backs. You might be the only person who has been a constant source of affection in a person's life and you might not even know it. As an ambassador, the third thing is, I am a kingdom carrier. I am a kingdom carrier. I love this. The kingdom of God, I know you guys already know this, the kingdom of God is peace, righteousness, and joy. I know you know it, peace, righteousness, and joy. It's not necessarily a physical, a physical place that you go to, but it's mostly a spiritual reality, right? And a lot of people got that mistaken. A lot of people, especially uh, in, you know, in Jesus' time, thought that the kingdom was like an actual physical place, and that's a mistake because you'll miss it. If you're looking for a physical place, it is a spiritual reality, peace, righteousness, and joy. And we are told in scripture that we've been given the keys to the kingdom. Paul calls us here, so we've been entrusted uh, the ministry of opening the door. I I love this analogy. So we have the keys to the kingdom, and then we also have the authority to open the door. And and again, for people to experience the reconciliation between God and them. And when I say reconciliation, to, bring, uh, to be brought back to uh, friendly relations, it's not on God's side. God has already done everything he needed to do. He has given us the son. It is we in our minds, right, who are enemies in our minds of God. It's we who need to be reconciled back to God. It's a one-way thing because God's already right there at the door. So how, how amazing is that we as the body of Christ have the keys to the kingdom. We open the door. We keep it open so that way people may freely enter. And, be, and again, be brought back into those friendly relations with God. That's all we have to do. And again, it's not a chore. This is not a to-do list. You don't have to save people. But you can provide a safe environment for people to have that experience in your life. And the last thing I have is this. And Brittany, I'm not sure where Brittany is. If she can help me uh, cl- uh, close. I have one more thing for you. And I think this one, this one hits me the hardest. As an ambassador... I am multiculturally competent. This is a heavy, heavy terminology. So I, uh, I'm enrolled at IUS. Uh, into, I'm uh, completing my master's program in, in uh, student counseling. And for a year now, I've been enrolled in this program. And we've been talking about this topic for a year, to be multiculturally competent and what that looks like. Because we know 2020, man, when one thing's go wrong and so do a million other things, right? We've just been exposed to a lot, of un, a lot of undercurrents that are happening in our country. And everything is being brought back right into the surface. And it's in all of our faces. And I think it's, it is essential for you to be an effective ambassador. You have to be multiculturally competent. The kingdom of God is diverse. It doesn't look like just you or just me. There are all kinds of people who are in the kingdom of God. And to be an effective ambassador, a, represent, a representative of a country, when you are chosen by the president to be, a, to be an ambassador, you are expected to be multiculturally competent. You are, ex, you are expected to know the culture that you are entering 
in order to make establish any kind of trust and that's what we need to be multiculturally competent people we are aware of other cultures we celebrate other cultures and here's the most important piece we treat people with unconditional positive regard trust me i wouldn't be telling you this without first acknowledging that this is my biggest struggle i have a strong sense of justice that i've always had to fight sometimes i can get into this mindset of you god what what had you know what was coming to you and that's a legalistic mindset that's not a restorative mindset and i don't want it to be a part of who i am deep down inside so i have to retrain my brain and i have to treat people with unconditional positive regard what does that look like i treat people with dignity i treat people with respect i learn about their culture i listen to them i make them feel heard i don't talk at them i talk to them I hear them and I value them. As a multiculturally competent ambassador whose number one ultimate purpose is to bring the ministry of reconciliation back, I can't discriminate, devalue and suppress people because that's having double standards. And that's not the kingdom of God. That is not experiencing peace righteousness or joy i'm actually stripping that away from the people that i'm trying to bring jesus to it is so unattractive and this is again the heaviest one and in order to be an effective ambassador i have to help restore people i am a safe person to people i am a kingdom carrier i have confidence in that and i am multiculturally competent this is an amazing gift the ministry of reconciliation but it requires us the body of Christ to be courageous and step out of our comfort zone. We have to learn to remove our own biases that we have against people. And and, and on, that's unconscious bias is something that is making you believe that is false about other people, but it's not at the forefront of your mind which makes it even more tricky to spot because you think I'm a good person, right? That I like everybody. But if we were to start reflecting on some of your behavior or some of my behavior, I should say, I only have to I can only talk about myself here. If I were to reflect my behavior, I would uncover some biases that I have against people and that creates division in our mind and then it translates to how I treat other people so to be truly an effective ambassador I also have to understand that there are some things that I might need to reconcile with Christ and there are some things that you still need to reconcile with Christ. And this is a process. This is not a 20 minute thing that's gonna happen to you. This is a constant daily thing. And here's what I want you guys to know. How do you reconcile some things to God? How do you, how do you remove some biases that you have against people? There is so much stuff that's always spoken out to you on social media, family, friends, right? It's things that strip away at you slowly. But in this place, you will always hear the words of life spoken over you. And as I was praying, God, what do you want me to say to the people? He started giving me certain, certain scriptures, certain verses that I want to read over you. And that's how I want to close with you. If you are struggling with an identity crisis and you might not even know it, and here's how you do know it. Can you boldly stand up right now? If we were all to close our eyes, can you stand up and can you say, I am the son of God. I am the daughter of God. I am fully righteous, I am holy, and I am blameless. I am His child and I'm confident, I am empowered. When I open up my mouth, miracles start pouring out. Can you say all these things with true confidence, with full confidence? Because if you can't, then you need to recon reconcile some things with God. You have a little bit of work to do because in order to be an effective ambassador, you have to believe that you, within your true identity, your DNA, you are good. People can spot a fake. You have to believe that you are truly good. 
I was scrolling through Instagram a couple of days ago and I came across uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf's one of her uh, posts and I thought her quote was so fitting for what I wanted to tell you guys and here's what it says. Everything we do begins with a thought. If we want to change every, every, anything in our life, we must have to change our thinking, our mind. There's always a struggle in our mind for a true identity. And so I want to speak, I want to replace some lies with some truths over you. And if one of these scriptures speaks to you, write it down, memorize it, put it in your mirror, uh, put it in your car, put it on your fridge, wherever you want to put it, put it because you, it needs to be always in front of you. You need to start believing the truth that God is saying about you. So the first one is Ephesians 2.10. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned and advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. You are his poetry, his masterpiece. John 1 12, but those who embraced him and took hold of his name were given authority to become the children of God. John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen and commissioned you to go into the world and bear fruit. Reconcile people back to him. And your fruit will last because whatever you ask of my father for my sake, he will give to you. Our God is an ultimate gift giver. He only gives out blessings. He only has good things to say about you. Romans 8 37 yet even in the midst of all of these things we triumph over them all even in the midst of COVID-19 we triumph over it all for God has made us to be more than conquerors and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything we've won because God loves us Ephesians 1 4 and he chose us to be his very own joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the universe he had you on his mind because of his great love he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with unstained innocence write this scripture verse down ephesians 1 4 you are unstained with innocence first corinthians 1 8 he will keep you steady and strong to the very end, making your character mature so that you will be found innocent on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are innocent. And it is God who will be doing some things through you. Sometimes you will feel like you're not qualified, but you're not alone because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are his temple and he is not going to leave you high and dry. God cares about what you care about. He cares about the small things in your life. God saved our cat. He did. We have this kitten, her name is Ladybug, and she had a terrible accident. She needed an emergency surgery, but they told us it was going to be really, really expensive, and with heavy hearts, we had to decline. I cried for 12 straight hours praying all night, God heal our cat. And the only thing that I kept hearing in my, in my head over and over again, I care about the things that you care about. I care about the things that you care about. And I kept repeating, you care about the small things. You care about the small things. And then our cat was healed the next day. God cares about the small things in your life. He's never stopped listening. And if you feel like he's not answering your prayer, look again because he's never stopped talking to you. Look again. Let me pray over you guys. Jesus, our dad, we, we are so overwhelmed with the amount of blessings that you have given us. You just keep pouring your gifts out on us unconditionally. You don't ever stop. All you do is you do good in our lives. We are humbled and we, are, we feel so loved. You have empowered us to be ambassadors. You have called us to lead the ministry of reconciliation. You will let us have this amazing gift so that we may experience others being reconciled back to you. You don't ever forget about us. You hold us in your arms. You've called us worthy. You've called us righteous. You've called us holy. 
We are blessed to know you, Lord. And we know that you've never once turned away from us. You have every, everything that is going on in our lives, you have it in your hands. You are not the author of all the bad things, but you will take the bad things that we're looking at and you will turn them to your glory. We know that because you have spoken it. Empower us to love other people well. You have given us certain people that are a part of our ministry of, the, of this reconciliation. Open up our eyes. Give us the words to, to say to them. Help us make them feel safe. Expose us to some of our biases that we might have about other people and other cultures. Because ultimately we know that you love everyone and that is our goal here at Hill City. We love you, Lord, and that's in your name we pray. Amen.